Hello, hello, this is Dragan, it's a writer from Macedonia, a small country that has the population of, insert area from LA that has population of around 2 million. My task here is to introduce today's episode. Our guest is D.W. Wilbur. He brings over 30 years of experience in security and counterterrorism as a former intelligence officer serving with the CIA and the Department of Defense in Eastern and Western Europe and the Middle East and in law enforcement. What's especially interesting for me is that Dell also served as counterterrorism advisor and consultant to the State Investigative and Protection Agency for the government of Bosnia and Herzegovina and the Autonomous Republic of Srpska. That's interesting because it's in our neighborhood. Joining us as co-host in today's episode is former Army Ranger Tim Abel. And I know you don't forget, but I would still remind you that you should support the Break It Down show by doing a monthly subscription and also support Save the Brave as we battle PTSD. So thank you for listening to this foreign guy and enjoy today's episode. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This Easton. is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morata. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is D.W. Wilbur, and welcome to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. This is D.W. Wilbur. He's a buddy of ours, and uh, he comes to us via uh, Tim Abel and Michael Broderick and those guys. They, uh, the character Dell in Fathers and Sons, that short video for the Terminal List, uh, uh, Jack Carr uh, short that they made. Uh, Dell is, is an honor of, of D.W. here, Dell Wilbur. And so I guess let's just start there, man. When, when they come to you and say, hey, we want to do you this honor of naming this character after you, what do you, what do you think about that? <laughs> Well, I mean, it was pretty cool. It was a, a surprise, naturally, but uh, you know, it was uh, it was kind of cool. And uh, you know, watching uh, and 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 certainly having uh, Tim Abel as the uh, the character uh, using my name, uh, I thought that was uh, uh, you know, he and I resemble each other so much. I mean, you know, the hair and everything. So, but uh, it was cool. It was good. The I, I guess for the audience's yeah, sake, if you happen to not know who uh, Dell is, here is the, the link to his website. He is an author and has written a lot of stuff for Town Hall and a variety of locations. But I think the thing where we should start is the fact that you were an undercover CIA counter-terror agent. I guess it's probably the best way to describe it. Yeah, I mean, I worked for the agency for a number of years and uh, um, overseas. I, of course, I, I served overseas in uh, undercover capacities of uh, you know, they don't send anybody overseas as an overt, uh, you know, employee. Uh, but uh, I worked in Eastern and uh, Western Europe and, uh, uh, and, and the Middle East. And uh, so uh, I, I, I jokingly say I, I was also a cop for about 10 years. So I'm kind of a dual threat. You know, I can, uh, I can be uh, an, an intelligence officer as well as a police officer. And uh probably uh, screw up both you know equally as well so i guess, I guess let's, let's let's spend some time, spend some time there because time obviously i'm a counterintelligence counter agent i've got a lot of time in europe i've got time in afghanistan and iraq we uh, overlap a lot we probably have been on the same camp if not in the same room at some point during our careers uh including you know maybe even bosnia what years were you in in, uh, in the former yugoslavia states uh, i was there in two, 2013 oh okay so and i was uh uh, I was over there on a, on a State Department program, or actually it was a combination State Department, Department of Justice program. Uh, I was a counterterrorism advisor to the um, Bosnian, uh, basically the FBI slash CIA, and uh, working with them on uh, on counterterrorism uh, efforts uh, inside the, uh, the former Yugoslav Republic. When people when hear that hear kind that of work, work, I mean, would you say, so you're sort of in the same world as me, like sometimes people will peg me as a contractor, but really what I am was professional level capacity flexed in a variety of areas. Uh, for a while, I was in the army. And then for a while, I worked as a civilian. And then sometimes I worked on a specific intel contract filling a, a specific line item. And it was always counterintelligence collection focused. But if you were to say, I can't say I'm retired army because I'm not, I wouldn't be long enough to do that. You uh, couldn't say I was a contractor because I was only on the contract for a few years. You couldn't necessarily say I was a, a DA civilian. But you could absolutely say I was a spy because I left the camp all the time and talked to locals. How, how do you characterize your experience? 
Well, in, in Bosnia, I mean, I was was overt uh, there. I was, uh, again, working on a, uh, like I said, the uh, DOS, DOJ program. And so the, the Bosnians that I dealt with on a daily basis, I mean, they were certainly, you know, familiar with my background. In fact, they, you know, they received a copy of my resume uh, before I ever went over there to, uh, so that they knew, you know, who they were dealing with and what my uh, experience and level of expertise was. And uh, so, I mean, it, it, it actually was a, uh, uh, an enjoyable experience. They, they were very interested and open towards, you know, having someone that, uh, you know, that, that was, was there to try to help them out with some of the issues that they were dealing with. Um, most people don't, probably don't even realize that back in the early 90s when the the uh, Bosnian war the, the was taking place between Bosnia and Serbia uh there were a lot of uh, you know, wahhabis that came from uh, Saudi Arabia that that came to fight you know for the the muslims uh the bosniaks in uh, in bosnia and uh, uh a lot of them stayed after the uh, Dayton accords ended the war and uh, you know the uh, uh peace kind of uh, more or less came to the uh, uh to the area, uh, though it's still simmering right below the surface. Uh, but uh, a lot of those Wahhabis, just in years uh, when I got there, uh, they had kind of assert themselves a little bit. And uh, uh, Bosnia was starting to experience some uh, some acts of terrorism and had some bombings against local police stations and things of that nature. So they were concerned about, uh, uh, about you know, trying to keep a lid on that type of activity and uh, not let it get out of out of hand. Yeah, the when you yeah. when you do our kind of work, you're oftentimes chasing a potential threat. Uh, that and, and I would I would uh, see if I can say this fairly to everybody who works above the ground level where you're trying to turn to things. It's like they they spin the wheel for threat of the week. You know, this time it's going to be a car bomb hitting the mayor's uh, office, and you know it's like well, there's nothing out here indicating that because they're good at hiding it or it doesn't exist, and so you're always sort of chasing this negative. And I found that if I um, I was conscious of what the threat up higher was perceived to be, but I kept my mind open to what it was on the ground. I was a lot more successful at giving the commander information he didn't otherwise have. And a lot of times it wasn't even threat based. It was more like you're losing right here. This is a problem right here. This specific system is not working the way that you're likely being told is that important to you. And so I would say the vast majority of the collection I did, I mean, every day going out, getting something that no one else knew, the vast majority of it was non-lethal, which which ultimately, which ultimately, I would say, increases the stability of an area if you're able to constantly, if, if, if we're less of a problem outside in the villages and everything else, uh, everybody's a lot happier and there's a lot less conflict, except for on the days when there's not. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I did an awful lot of training uh, to, I, I, in fact, I did quite a bit of traveling around uh, around Bosnia and uh, into the the autonomous Republic of Srpska that was created out of the the Dayton Accords, uh, and I met with their local or regional you know police uh, chiefs and uh, uh, members of the uh, uh, SIPA, which was the State Investigation and Protection Agency, their FBI, uh, and I, I did a lot of presentations you know for them on terrorism and. Uh, you know things that uh, uh, that hopefully would help them in uh, recognizing threats and conducting investigations into potential problem areas. Um, so, uh, and and one of the other things I did was actually created a uh, a, a terrorist threat reporting mechanism for uh, for the country, which uh, ultimately was uh, actually adopted by their legislature and. Uh, uh, and was put into uh, to effect, and it's uh, the kind of a, a reporting mechanism where people can, uh, just like we have in this country, you know, we've got uh, our uh, CT officials that are constantly saying, uh, you know, see something, say something. Well, this was, you know, kind of along those lines, but it was much more detailed, and it provided um, real detailed information that uh, that typical people might not recognize as a potential terrorist threat. You know, someone buying a lot of chemicals or something, you know, for no, um, uh, you know, reasonable purpose and uh, because it doesn't go along with their profession or their needs or whatever. And, you know, those are the kinds of things that uh, that I put into this document that would would 
try to help people recognize, uh, like I said, what might be a, a potential problem. And anyway, it, it seemed to be pretty well received by the uh, uh, by the Bosnian government. And uh, I, as far as I know, it's it's being used to this day. So. One of the things when you work with Bosnians versus, I would say, like Middle Eastern folks, is there's just a lot more stability and security in a place like the former Yugoslavian states. Uh, electricity is more, like right now, literally at my house, the power is out for the next few hours because they're replacing a power pole on our neighborhood. And so for the next four hours or so, there's an announced power outage, right? But if you go to Iraq, Baghdad, I mean, one of the biggest cities in the world, you don't know when and where for how long you'll or how how sustained your power will be. And that's just infuriating, you know, to the people there. It drives you crazy. It's 100 something degrees outside. You can't run an air conditioner. You can't run a fan. You know, you don't have an electricity. And, and I know you'll appreciate this, Del. I had a, an Iraqi farmer say to me, hey, how long would your government operate without electricity? And I you know, had to basically say, you know, about eight minutes. <laughs> You know, because we would lose our minds. And that's one of the things in these conflict zones. It's stuff like electricity that really drives people bananas because they can't do anything reliably. And, you know, it's really, it's a, it's a huge exasper, exa, exasperating factor for all of these things. Well, you know, uh, a case in point is what just recently happened in uh, Texas uh, during the, uh, the freak cold spell they had down there. Power was out for for hours at a time in, in certain locations, and you know I have a daughter that lives in Texas, and uh, you know they lost power for about eight hours. Uh, you know, s- suffered some, uh, and they were actually on the uh, uh, the the lucky side. There were other places where the power was out for for quite a bit longer. I live in the Midwest, and you know we're kind of in thunderstorm and tornado alley, and uh, so it's not uncommon for us to lose power for you know, uh, four, five hours. And, you know, I mean, we've become used to it because it happens, you know, with fair, fairly uh, regularity this time of year, especially. Uh, so, you know, you, you cope with it and you deal with it, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that, uh, that live in high density areas, maybe in the, uh, you know, uh, large cities or whatever, living in apartment complexes and, uh, you know, and they've, they, they, they lose power. And I mean, literally, they're stuck in elevators. They're, you know, they're not, they can't, you know, if they live uh, on the 40th floor, they're, they're walking up flights of stairs. I mean, you name it. So, uh, so it's, uh, you know, what you said is, is really true. We, we are have become very, very dependent upon electricity and our enemies in the world know that too. Yeah. And that's a great counterterrorism point. I want to bring that up in a second here, but I want to spend another moment just in this. And you're illustrating a great thing in Texas during the storm, they were filling their bathtubs with water because something that's just taken for granted every day, fresh water running in your house is so uh, exceptional in so many parts of the world, you know, that it instantly becomes valuable when you don't have access to it. And you're willing to fill your tub and garbage cans full of water, you know, because you don't know when you'll have it again. And, and these things are not norms in, in Iraq or Afghanistan. And heck, I would imagine even in parts of like the, the Yugoslavian states, it's, uh, you know, not guaranteed that they, they have an indoor water supply. And that's just one little small thing. Yeah, the thing I wanted to mention too about the counter-terror, you know, um, let's, I want to get into counterterrorism. And you said uh, in, your, in your bio that you're an undercover agent. I think we should spend a moment there talking about what undercover means, because I don't think that the audience understands that. Like we all hear it and we go, ooh, sexy and exciting. But what does it mean when you're undercover? In, uh, you know, the agency, uh, uh, in, in most cases, uh, uh, they do not have overt employees overseas. I mean, they, you know, they, they couldn't function for one thing. They're, uh, they wouldn't be very successful at their job if everybody knew that, uh, you know, this person's a spook, you know I mean? So uh, the agency has agreements between other government agencies and that, that provide, uh, you know, cover positions basically, you know, for, for agency employees who are serving overseas. Uh, I spent my time uh, uh, partly under Department of Defense cover and for and uh, Department of State cover. And I mean, and and I'm not giving any secrets here or anything because that's you know that's something that's well well known. Um, but anyway, as I said, you know, you're not going to be very effective in your job if you go overseas and everybody knows you're a spook. Uh, 
so that's in essence what it means is you're serving, you know, undercover. You're not an overt employee. A lot of the employees, uh, agency employees that work at headquarters in Langley are overt. They can put down on a, you know, a credit application or whatever, who their employee, you know, who their employer is that they work for the, uh, for the agency. Uh, the agency will acknowledge their employment and that. And I mean, they're, they're over. They're not going overseas uh, to work, uh, you know, they're working maybe in an analyst job or something uh, or some other support position at, at, uh, at the agency back in the U S. So, uh, so there's no need for them to, to be serving in a, in an undercover capacity. But again, those of us that, that do travel overseas and, uh, uh, and work, you know, in a foreign environment, uh, it's pretty much a standard because, you know, you're not going to be effective. And also you're a target. I mean, you're an American target. Any, you're in a target overseas for terrorist organizations, if you're an American anyway, but they love to be able to get their hands on an agency employee that would, uh, uh, that would be even, you know, kind of a, uh, feather in their cap. So, uh, you know, it's like I said, you want to, you know, try to <laughs> limit your exposure as much as possible for just for counterterrorism's sake. Yeah. And let's spend a little more time here because, I, you know, I'm on the opposite end, right? As an army person or department of the army civilian, uh, I'm not provided a cover. And the most I can do is say I'm with American security or something, you know? And so I would take the other tack and be overly over. Like, I'm absolutely here to ask questions. You, you know, I'm absolutely going to f- try to keep people safe because that is the paradigm that I work under. It's different. For, and I, this is for the audience more than for you and I. It's different for CIA folks because they have a different mission. I'm oftentimes running around with the platoon. And so my permissibility is there lethality. And so I walk around with those guys. And so it's different. A CIA person isn't afforded a platoon to go walk around or, you know, all these different protections that are in place. It's a different mission. So for me, I am over because I know that the villagers already think that who is this guy? Why is he asking these questions? And I try to get to know them and build trust. And I build trust by being honest on why I'm there. But I also say to them, if I ask you a question you don't want to answer, or you feel it's dangerous to you, don't answer it. Like I'm never going to put you in, in any extra danger. And that is always, and maybe I'm the only person that does that that I know of, but that's always worked for me, Dell, was to be overt about my overt collection because it doesn't, it doesn't pay me to, to be dishonest because my main currency when I'm outside the wire is trust. Well, I mean, absolutely. You've got, uh, uh, but you know, part of that, uh, how a, a an agency, a case officer that uh, do their job is, is also developing that trust, you know, and uh, I mean, there's there's a lot of of um, things that go into you know being an operations officer overseas and that, which a lot of it I, I can't uh, you know can't really discuss in that, but uh, uh, but suffice it to say that that uh, in as in any relationship, whether you're a police officer dealing with an informant or or it, it, the example that you you gave for for yourself, uh, in order to get people to feel comfortable and want to work with you, you know, want to cooperate with you in that, there has to be a level of, a relationship has to be developed and it has to include a level of trust. I mean, that's, you know, that's just a fact of life. If they don't trust you in that, they're, they're not going to have anything to do with you. So, um, uh, so that I, I think is, uh, probably more important than it, particularly when you think about it, a, someone who we're trying to recruit to spy for us against their own country uh, they're putting their lives in your hands, basically, you know, so, yeah. uh, yeah. they're not going to be too, uh, 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 confident of doing that if, if there's no level of trust that's been developed between you. Yeah. And we, we're getting into the danger zone in terms of classified things. We're not going to talk about anything classified, everybody just, uh, so cool, cool your jets, but you're right. If I'm going to recruit somebody to, to be a source for me, then I had better have established, I better know who that person is, why they operate, what their goals are, you know, so that they know that I have their best interest in mind because I need to know what their motivation, you need to know so much about them. You don't just show up and you you have to develop this person. You have to develop a real relationship so that if anything does get sideways, which it inevitably will, you're already ahead of the game because you spent a lot of this time on the front end. It doesn't do anybody any good to recruit a source and then have them get killed the next day because you have been reckless. And, and, and my, on my side of things, you have to move fast. You have to be tactical. You have to have reports on the commander's desk all the time because the battlefield moves too fast. But in the, uh, 
but when it comes to source operations, I just don't know that you can do it much faster um, than the CIA folks do because it's just it's just it's too dangerous for everybody involved. The area is not permissible, and a lot of times I don't think it's permissible enough to even try to run sources. Anyhow, I don't want to get us too to the edge with classification, but what is it in terms of like the caring for the source and those kind of things? Well, it's it's there's too much at stake. And I, I'm I'm talking about beyond just your personal safety or the the safety of the people you work with, but you know your your national security. There's just too much at stake uh, to to go to, to to cut corners, you know, to take chances or whatever. Uh, you know, there are times probably when uh, when information is time critical. Uh, perhaps it has maybe it has something to do with. Uh, uh, an attack against a U.S. installation or something that's planned, you know, and and uh, uh, you don't have a lot of advance notice in that. So there may be may be occasions where you have to take that uh, that time limitation into consideration, and you may adjust your uh, your tactics a little bit. Uh, but even but those those occasions are few and far between, and uh, uh, and then you're going to even even then you're going to to uh, factor into your planning uh, contingencies for, well, what if this is all bogus information? What if this isn't true? You know, what if this is to an attempt to draw some, you know, draw us out or whatever, or to set us up or something. And so these are the kinds of things you have to think about continually when you're, when you're assessing whether or not information that you've received is, is true and accurate. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely not a, uh, it's not an easy job. <laughs> I'll say that it's not necessary. Yeah, it's not an easy job. It's a dangerous job, and it's a job that is dangerous not just for you, but for your friends. And also, in terms of security, being able to measure what what's reasonable, what works, and uh, keeping in mind that not only are you trying to be safe, you're trying to keep your friends safe, and you're also trying to keep the people outside the wire safe. Because if somebody outside the wire is getting killed because of your collection efforts. That creates chaos in that family, in that tribe, in that set of people. Because, hey, Pete showed up, and all of a sudden things got sideways really fast. You're not going to be an effective collector. You'll never know this, but you won't be an effective collector from then on. You'll, and then you have to always ask yourself. It's, it's that thing I always say to young agents: Who's running who? Right? You have to always assume that you're being run, and you have to look at it that way because you're making mistakes you can't realize. And and in our world, it's easy to be arrogant and have a big ego and think. I mean. Dell, you know, if you were to if we were to go around and ask, you know, human collectors if they're, you know, how how would they rate themselves on a scale of one to ten, there'd be a whole lot of nines and tens in the room. Not not many threes and twos and fours, you know. No, I mean it's true. Like I said, you uh, that's one of the things that uh that I always, you know, um was was my practice, whatever was was self evaluation. You know, it's easy to fall into that trap where you become, you know, confident in your abilities, which is a good thing to have. Uh, you don't want to be out there and be uh, indecisive and uh, uh, and lack that uh, that confidence in what you're trying to do in that. But you got to be careful not to become, you know, uh, arrogant about what you're doing and how you're doing in that. Because when that happens, then that's when you're going to make mistakes and when you're going to to um, uh, perhaps cut a corner because you think, you know, that, uh, you're better than you are. Uh, you're better than the training you received better than the information and that, that you've, uh, developed thus far and that. And then, uh, uh, and that's when, like I said, when mistakes are made and, and our mistakes, uh, not only impact us, but they potentially impact, you know, all, all the way up to the white house. I mean, uh, you know, they, they may reach, you know, the, the levels the highest levels of our government. If, we're not careful in what we do. So that's, I mean, that's in essence, that's our job is to, to collect information, to provide to the decision makers, to help them in formulating what our, our national policy is. And, you know, so you got to be careful in, in how you do that. Yeah, you do, especially in the counterterror world, because they're, they're always plotting and planning in a way that you're not supposed to know about. You know, they, they're trying to not be detected. And your job is to be so pervasive with your network that they're that they're always going to be detected and it's it's this fight between detection and, and non-detection and meanwhile again you can't piss in the pool so much that nobody wants you at the pool party and and that is so easy to accomplish and you're right i think about when i when i measure like when i'm doing things 
I try to think, how would I run me right now? And I always tell, I always start with ego. Like, can't is my ego being stoked? Am, am I being placated in some way? Is, is uh, someone lowering my threat assessment so that I feel safer than I really am? And, and I'm, I'm able to judge where I need to be because I've done it a lot. But if you're a young agent, if you're a young collector and you're trying to decide who's running who, and then what, what operation, what would they be doing? Like ego up, ego down, super simple with, with the, I mean, that's what I would try. If I was, if I came across you and we are on opposite sides of the, you know, opposite teams, I would be trying to see if I could simply get an advantage over you by, by working your ego, you know, whether it was stoking it or, or smashing it and seeing how you responded. I mean, that's one of the basic levers that any seasoned spy almost wouldn't even bother with another seasoned spy, but, but with younger people, I think it's really easy to do. That's where I would start. Well, yeah, I mean, people people like to uh, like to have their ego stroke. They like to hear about themselves. They like to, you know, to be complimented. Uh, I mean, you know, one of the, one of the things like I said, I, I I travel around the country and do a lot of of uh, presentations before different groups on uh, uh, counterterrorism and and, and uh, insurgencies and those kinds of things. One of one of the first things I tell people, and you know, they uh, oftentimes, you know, when I'm introduced to in that, they'll you know go over my bio a little bit, and then they'll say he's a counterterrorism expert, and I always correct them, and I always say the only the only terrorism experts out there are the ones doing it yeah. because they know exactly what they're going to do, when they're going to do it, and where they're going to do it, and yeah. usually we're left in their dust trying to catch up. So, you know, so uh, uh, to I guess you have to have a, a level of um, to be a little bit humble uh, when you're doing this kind of work, because the second you become too arrogant or the second you become a little bit overconfident in that, that's when you have the rug pulled out from under you. And that's when, uh, you know, bad things happen. So. Yeah. You, you become exploitable and, uh, and, and that ego will uh, absolutely bite you in the ass. Hey, we got Tim Abel coming into the studio with studio. us. Tim, what up? Tim, what up? Hey, Jess. Hey, Jess. Sorry, I'm late. Sorry. I was just, I'm late. I was just reading an outstanding, reading book, outstanding book here. Book. Well, that looks like Bell's book. Here, hey. I, I was just in chapter five. Chapter just give five. us a damn gun, okay? <laughs> How are you boys doing this morning? We're doing this morning. We're good. I'm trying to mod modulate uh, mics here because we got an echo on Tim's side. But let me just uh, do Tim. Uh, sorry, not Tim. Uh, let me do Dell the favor of saying, hey, get his book on Amazon. It's In the Shadow of the Swords. Those are Saddam's cross swords in Iraq. The Baghdad Police Academy. In the Shadow of the Swords. The Baghdad Police Academy. That link is in uh, the bottom of the page. And if you're listening on the podcast side, it'll be in the show notes. By the way, if you want to support the show, go to breakitdownshow.com, grab that PayPal link, put a little bit of money in the pot each month. That will definitely help. All that money goes right back into the show, whether it's uh, equipment or ads or something, you know, a, a trip that that's how you can support us. Always good on YouTube. If you rate and review, these things are big. So hit that subscribe button. Uh, so we started to show off, uh, Tim, talking about fathers and sons and how your character was Dell and how you guys named it after DW. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about that decision that you and Michael Broderick made with that character? Well, you know, I, at the time, did not even know that uh, the Delp I was playing was named after Delp. And I was honored once Michael told me, because um, it was coming off of COVID. It was December 1st when we filmed that in, in Los Angeles. And it was in November, Michael sent me a script that he wrote which was good. And then a week later, sent me another one with a, an updated script written by a Navy veteran and um, Vernon Mortensen, swift boat guy. And uh, it, it got even better and developed the characters even better. And the characters are based on, as we all know, Jack Carr's characters from the criminal series. And it was one of those most motivating things for me coming off of COVID and having 2020 being one of those years of, as an actor, kind of a wash, pretty much every actor out there and producer and director and writer, I think it was just shut down. And it was that bright little light at the end of the year. And Michael Broderick, I love the fact that uh, he, he had, I think he quoted Joseph Campbell when he said, you know, I, I, I we're sitting around doing nothing. So I just wanted to be proactive and I wanted to create a project. And I wanted to create it based on Jack Carr's book, books and characters. And uh, he goes, uh, 
this is what I've come up with. And it all, it all rounded about about if you read the terminal list, it starts off with uh, a Darcy Eccles rifle, which is a very high priced, hard to get, very much sought after. People wait years to have one custom built. You know, I think the cheap the, the, the cheapest one is about fourteen grand, and they go up to you know up to thirty and forty grand depending on what they're having done. And that's how that starts. And so Michael created this great storyline about how the Darcy Eccles came to be uh, and came to be gifted to, to James Reese. So, and I, at the time I had not read any of uh, James's books, uh, the James Reese novels. So I read the terminal list and uh, it was, uh, it really made sense to me. But the characters were of a military background. Much like you guys, I'll say they they were salty guys that were had been in these guys have been in the teams and the Navy SEALs specifically, and it was sort of just a world weary sense of the characters. And Michael's character played James Reese, his dad, who uh, kind of like you guys, he's kind of reminds me of, of, of your background because he started off being a SEAL and then turns to being a spook with the CIA and working doing all those covert type operations and. That was really the, the storyline. And I, again, I didn't know too much going into it, but we it just felt so comfortable. You know, it was well-written, well-directed by Ryan Curtis, uh, an Army veteran. Michael was so up to speed and could answer any question I had about the series. You know, we learned about the watch, learned about how that played into it, learned about uh, James Reese. And, and it really made sense just based on the characters, just based on the writing. And, you know, it was kind of this, this sense of, you know, Michael's a warrior, has put his put himself out there, uh, and now his son's following in his footsteps, which a lot of us like to think of our sons following, sons and daughters following in our footsteps. But now it's that worry that a father has that perhaps my son is going to go to war and not come back, or not come back the same. And it's all my fault because I'm the one that he's modeled his life after. So it, it really resonated and uh i mean the final pro- product was just wonderful Del, Del, what did you think of it though i thought it was i mean um you know i shared it with a lot of friends and then a lot of people saying when's the movie coming i want to see this you know they, they were uh they were very uh, <laughs> uh very interested in in seeing more uh, as i am i i think it was a uh uh, it was just really done well, and and both Tim and, and Michael uh, and I can't re- the young lady's name I can't remember her name now, um, but they they just Tying. interacted they so tie. well. Tying, uh, uh, they they all three interacted so well together, and even even though hers was a smaller part, she looked so comfortable in that role, and uh, you know, and and her interactions with him that were really uh, are really good, and uh, like I said, I I. I'd love to see more. I thought it was a uh, just really, really well done. And I have to say, I'm flattered that they they chose my name, not necessarily one of those Hollywood names. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it, I had to yeah. say too. Uh, I love it too. It had some uh, real genuine. Uh, it was genuine. I mean, look, Tim knows how to act. He's a ranger. He he knows exactly what he's bringing to the, the page, and obviously Michael does too. But it was fantastic. And if you guys uh, aren't aware yet, uh, Jack Carr is going to be on the show on Thursday. We have Michael Broderick co-hosting that one. So we'll be talking even more about this topic. And uh, it's funny, Jack Carr should be paying me for all I'm talking about his stuff. But uh, (laughs) we love his his work. Tim, we were, uh, Dell and I were talking about some of the ins and outs of of some spycraft stuff since we both have done that kind of work. And I wanted to push that conversation. I want to ask one more question on that and then we can let you ask some questions. But uh, Dell, when you talk about counterterrorism, you know, someone like uh, Timothy McVeigh blows up a whole uh, over 100 buildings, kills a bunch of people, doesn't use a gun at all. And, and we often get wrapped up around a gun as, as a tool or a means. But you and I both know you can you can get a U-Haul truck and the right amount of manure and, and you know, some fairly simple, not as simple as it used to be, but if you're, if you're diligent and you're patient, you can acquire all the things you need to make something much more horrible than what any rifle could ever do. What, what keeps you up at night as a counter-terror guy when you're in the field working? Like, what do you, like, I, I know what it does. I know what it is for me, but what is it for you, Dell? Well, I, I know uh, a lot of the, 
things that were discovered both in Iraq and then uh, uh, after the invasion and then also in Afghanistan. And what keeps me awake at night is similar to what we're going through right now with COVID. And that's a biological uh, or chemical weapons attack because, you know, it's it's something that the, the, the capability is out there and uh, um, it's it's deadly. And you can, uh, uh, if you, if you, if if our enemies in the you know the terrorism business, the the Al Qaeda, the ISIS, uh, uh, they certainly are interested in that kind of capability, and uh, and would do anything to get their hands on it. Um, you know, the Iranians, uh, though they may not do something uh, overtly themselves. You know, they they try their best to keep their fingerprints off of things, but that's not beyond them. To work with a you know uh, an organization like Al Qaeda or uh, or others and uh, and use them to do their dirty work for them. So those are the things. I mean, you know, we know that they had been doing research in that type of uh, capability, and it certainly hasn't stopped because the you know the war on terror seems to have you know uh, winded down a little bit because uh, uh, we let our guard down and. You know they are still actively pursuing uh, weapons of mass destruction to use against us. Do you think we should trust the Chinese that the uh, COVID outbreak came out of the Wuhan wet market, or would you continue to be? I mean, I, I know like until they can prove it emphatically with open international sources, uh, you know, I think that the uh, the lab is still in play. But that's just my that's how I see things in terms of counter terror and, and trying to keep us safe. And maybe you don't have an opinion on that, but I figured I would ask. Oh, I've said from the very start, when, when this first hit our country, uh, uh, we start, first started recognizing it for what it was, you know, probably a little over a year ago. Uh, I said way back then, I said, you know, I think this was probably something that was being experimented on in the lab and they lost, they lost control of it. They simply lost control of it, and uh, uh, it was, you know, being probably researched as as what its lethality lethality potential was, uh, you know, for perhaps a uh, you know a, a chemical weapons uh, or a biological weapons uh, you know use, and uh, and they just lost control of it, and uh, and then it it you know it didn't take much to uh, once they tried to cover that up and hide the fact that this was was on the loose. You know, it has spread, uh, well, obviously, all around the world. So, Tim, you have any Tim, questions have for Duff? No, I, I, I understand concur with uh, both of your uh, opinions about this. And I, after what happened this past year, I, I, that's the one thing that I think we should definitely fear is a, a biological weapon because. If this was something that just slipped out accidentally, well, imagine if it was fully weaponized and asserted throughout the world, uh, or if they were trying to damage us. If they just had agents with that specific biological agent with them and released them to all of our major metropolis, and uh, there's nothing we do. I think you see how it shut down our country, shut down our country. And uh, still to this day, I, mean, I live in Los Angeles, and uh, they still, we, I would say they still instill fear in California and New York and all these other states that are still locked down because uh, I don't know why, but it, it, that's where we are now. But I, I think a biological weapon is the weapon of the future that we hear. And it's funny that you're having Jack on because that's kind of what his new book's about. And, uh, you know, I, I don't understand why, and maybe you guys can answer this, is why is our government, our agencies, why do they not want to say the World Health Organization as well? Why do they not want to go? What was the facts? What was the truth? Why came they to Wuhan? And why have we allowed them to store so much evidence that could point to be how it happened and also if it did happen? I, I don't know. I, I, for the life of me, I, I mean, I, I think uh, President Trump was trying to do that. He was he was basically, uh, um, you know, describing it, uh, you know, as the China virus and that. But uh, uh, the thing that concerns me more than than uh, uh, 
the origins of the of this uh, is the fact that uh, I, I I see us letting our guard down. Uh, we need to stay on the offensive in this war on terror since since nine eleven of two thousand and one. You know, and it's easy for people to get uh, to forget what happened. It's easy for people to uh, to get tired of being you know on the offensive, uh, but. The fact is, we have to stay on the offensive because if we don't, we're setting ourselves up again for uh, for another attack. And this one could be, again, even more deadly uh, than what happened on uh, 9-11 of 01. And uh, so, I, I mean, I, I, I'm concerned about that because I think uh, people are war weary uh, and the government uh, is uh, uh, not willing to continue the effort that needs to be done. So, uh, I think we're in for a rude awakening again if we don't stay on the offensive and, and do what we've got to do. Tim, I, I think, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Dell. I think about these uh, advantages, right? So let's say that this thing does break out of the Wuhan wet market and it still comes and destroys our confidence in ourselves, our confidence in our experts, our confidence in, in science. And if I'm a, uh, my offensive side of my brain thinks, man, if I'm a Chinese guy, if I'm a Russian guy, if I'm, you know, an Iranian dude who's tasked with undermining the stability of the United States and I'm going to use terrorism to do it, well, hey, thanks. Thanks for the help. <laughs> Wake up. I'm going to I'm going to leverage the hell out of this and and try to I mean, I would love to see this nation divided in half and and ready to fight one another and disagreeing about everything. It's, it's a big boon. How, how do we deal with it internally like this thing has come? And it's divided us, and we're so politically obsessed with with our party. We're so partisan that um, I don't know that it's that hard to be a uh, a terrorism guy against the United States and succeed. No, not at all. And uh, you know that that's one of the reasons why we need to stay on the offensive, and that we need to continue working towards gathering intelligence that uh, hopefully can head off some of these. You know, I one of the things I, I've spent uh, you know a lot of time overseas, and most recently I was I was in a Middle Eastern country, uh, working with their intel service, and uh, trying to uh, uh, give them an understanding of what's being done to them uh, by our adversaries, their adversaries, <clears throat> and one of the things that uh, that is. Uh, is going on all the time is basically covert influence operations. We have covert influence operations being conducted against us. I mean, constantly Chinese, the Iranians, the, the Russians, uh, they're very effective at it because it's easy. I mean, if you look at what happened with, um, the, uh, the Russia collusion, uh, scandal, if you want to call it that, that occurred back in, uh, 2016, I mean, uh, as Trump was taking office. Uh, we had, uh, and, and, and yes, there was some political, uh, actions taken, but, but we had, uh, a, uh, a, a covert operation against our country to undermine a, a sitting and duly elected president. There's no doubt in my mind that, that the, the Russians, the Chinese, uh, perhaps the Iranians, uh, were leveraging that to every, uh, level that they could. Uh, it was used that, to create dissension, to stir up uh, animosity, to uh, to exploit our political differences, uh, that goes on all the time, and they're going to continue to use it because it's very effective. The recent meeting in Alaska we had with our dignitaries, with the Chinese dignitaries, and how they they made a mockery of of our country and said, "Don't how dare you mention other Uyghurs and how they're treated by our country when you have such division in your country with." with uh, BLM riots going on, and protests, and uh, it basically shut down our, our dignitaries from saying anything else. It's like, oh, geez, what do we say? How do we respond to that? And here you have in, in, in China, you have these poor Uyghurs being put in the concentration camps, re-education camps disappearing, and yet we still do business with them no problem in our country because of the division. I mean, it, it comes down to, I mean, even the, it, the election laws, Georgia, which, uh, I mean, the split in our country, the divide is, is palpable and, and it's so easily debunked, but the news and the news cycles keep repeating it and repeating it and repeating it. 
And then the people that don't do the research just believe it. And so it creates this divide that has, has been going on. I mean, back since Reagan, we've had this, but it's gotten so much worse now. And uh, our enemies have exploited that to the, to the maximum. And uh, I don't understand how our Congress and our uh, Senate don't understand that. You know, our our uh, right now in this country, our law enforcement is under under siege. Basically, it's under attack. You know, and we all know that you know ninety nine point nine percent of of cops out there are just doing a difficult job and doing it the best they can. They're they're hardworking. You know, yes, there are as in any profession, as with the military or with the agency. You know, there are bad you know bad eggs, and uh, no one you know, hates a bad cop worse than other cops do because that individual paints them all with a broad brush and uh, makes their job more difficult. But right now what's going on in this country is is definitely a concerted effort to undermine police, undermine law enforcement so that they can't do their job or that they're, you know, they're, they're at the point where they're hesitant to try to do their job anymore because, you know, they look what's happening. They've got politicians in Washington, D.C., you know, uh, well-known members of Congress and the Senate and that that are absolutely crucifying police officers before the facts are even, you know, uh, from an incident are even gathered yet and uh, before a full investigation has been conducted. So that's what we're what's going on in this country. That's what we're up against is is a concerted effort to undermine authority in this country and undermine the rule of law and to undermine the uh, the authority of our government to to uh, protect us and to make the kinds of decisions that need to be made to ensure that that we remain a, a stable nation. Let me grab these reins here and yank us off the political topic so we can be done with that for a while. And let's talk about your fantastic <laughs> book, In the Shadows of the Swords, the, B- the Baghdad Police Academy. And we're talking about police, so here's our transition. Uh, why did you write the book? And then what do you think of our efforts to create a better Iraqi police force? I know when I went out and one of the things I would collect on is, is how far are the local Iraqis from calling the police? I mean, there's a measure of effect right there, right? Like affect. Can, can we get the Iraqis to call the police? And the answer where I was at the time I was there was no, that they were like below fifth on the list of things they would do in response to a crisis, which again, commanders were desperate to learn this. Be like, what do you mean? Nobody wants to call the police, but that was the answer. So uh, why write the book and talk a little bit about training police in another country and how challenging that can be? Well, just, you know, from Iraq, I mean, I can tell you, there's people can look, uh, look it up on YouTube. There's a hilarious video on YouTube. Uh, all you gotta do is type in why Iraq has taken so long. And some of you may have seen it now, but, uh, uh, you'll see a, uh, a soldier, a U.S. soldier who is conducting PT with, uh, with a group of Iraqi police cadets. They're doing jumping jacks. Uh, if you get a chance, look, uh, look it up because it's hilarious. It, it kind of explains in a nutshell why it was taking so long to try to get, to, get the Iraqi police trained. Uh, it, it was a difficult prospect because of the uh, – when they got rid of – you know they disbanded the Iraqi police now because they didn't want any – any Baathist party members in that to uh, to have any positions of authority in, in the new uh, democratic Iraq. Uh, and, and in essence, what they did was they created an insurgency because they all these pe- people who were police officers or military members suddenly were without a job, without any authority that they once had. Uh, and, you know, they became, uh, you know, the kind of the, the nucleus of, a, of, a, of an insurgency. And, uh, the police training program was, um, I mean, it was, I think, ill-conceived from the very start because no way are you going to to train people in that part of the world, particularly who had lived under a brutal dictatorship for, for decades, uh, how to be officer friendly. You know, the people weren't going to uh, accept that. Uh, there had, we talked earlier about uh, having to develop a level of trust with, uh, uh, you know, between you and, and the people that you're trying to recruit. Well, in this case, the people that you're trying to serve, uh, there, there was no level of trust. I mean, the, the police under Saddam Hussein were, were brutal, you know, and, uh, they were, uh, and they reveled in their brutality. I mean, they, you know, it was a very coveted job, uh, under Saddam because, uh, you know, basically you got a, you had a, a free ticket to do whatever you wanted. 
So changing that mentality uh, in the community, but also in the potential police recruits was difficult. Uh, They didn't know anything about Western policing methods. And here we were trying to convince them that, you know, that this was uh, was what they needed to do. So it, it definitely presented some challenges. As human beings and these Iraqi recruits, they're capable. They have the ability to learn. What is it about the, their culture? And having had the brutality of Saddam's police, do they not understand what you're trying to teach them in terms of uh, policing techniques that will hopefully keep your country in control? Why are they? Why are they? I'll say. And I don't mean this about every Iraqi police that are officer, but uh, Keystone Cop. What, what, what is the what is the issue? What is the problem? Well, part of the problem was was again cultural, religious. Um, an example would be, um, you know, we get we did classes on uh, domestic violence, and we're telling police recruits in your class you might have twenty five cadets out there, you know that you you know. People have to report, you know, if someone's beating their wife. Well, if your local imam at the mosque you attend is telling you that it's okay to to smack your wife around if she misbehaves, your judgment that she's misbehaved in some way, uh, you can smack her around as long as you don't leave marks on her face, you know. And literally, that was being taught over there by you know some of the religious figures. So here we are trying to tell <laughs> Iraqi police cadets. You know uh, that that's a crime uh, when their imam, uh, who has a hell of a lot more authority and more influence than we did, uh, is telling them just the opposite. So you know that alone was a challenge. Um, you know, so it it, it definitely was. Uh, uh, I think something that uh, uh, a lot of people, when they went into it, uh, when I first got over there, I mean, your eyes your eyes were opened to uh, the fact that you're you know you got you you've got an uphill fight ahead of you. I would add to that because I've seen a lot of these things happen. And actually this guy right here, I'm going to put him on the screen. This guy, Ali, he's my friend. He's from Iraq and uh, we're getting to know each other. And we talk about the cultural differences all the time. You know, he, um, he would love to come to the United States and have another wife. And I'm like, yo, we don't have second wives here, you know? And he's like, but in Islam, you can do that, you know? And so <laughs> this is the reality. Like there's nothing wrong with how he thinks because he's over here in Iraq and that's their normal. And I'm like, okay, well, if you want an American woman um, and he's like, I want a Christian wife or an Islamic wife. And I'm like, that doesn't matter here. It doesn't work that way here. And I don't pick, I don't pick some lady out for you. You've got to do that yourself. There's a completely different way they approach life. And when we start off with these, uh, you know, we use the police academy, these police academy 101 basic themes, like don't hit your wife. Uh, it doesn't play there because it's just not a reality for them. You know, I went through this whole long like source operation, how you control a conversation, like three week block of instruction. And at the end of it, the guy's like, but Pete, we will just hook up their balls to electricity and then we will, we will shock their balls. And I'm like, yeah, well, that's another technique, but I mean, (laughs) we're, you know, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, (laughs) you know, I, uh, well, one of the things that I tried to, to, uh, talk about more in the book was, (laughs) Uh, believe it or not, the humorous aspects uh, for people. <laughs> thanks for for people going to like us. I mean, you know, people who are cops or whatever in the U.S. going to a foreign country like that, and uh, uh, and yeah, you're in the middle of a war zone. But but I think anybody that's been in the military or has been in police work knows, you know, they've heard about that gallows humor that we all have, and uh, uh, and and it's true. You know, we we did. Uh, uh, one of it's one of the ways that you avoided going crazy, you know, was uh, uh, was by you know finding humor in what you were doing and that playing practical jokes on each other, which we we did a lot of that. We played practical jokes. We uh, uh, we told lies and war stories each evening, sitting around a campfire, you know, and 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 that's what I tried to share in the book was some of those humorous aspects of what we were doing over there because there was a lot of humor. I mean, there really was, and uh, people may find that. You know, uh, uh, curious that that you know you're in the middle of a war zone and that, and, and you're laughing about getting martyred and uh, uh, and shot at. But I mean, that's the reality. Uh, you know, when the, when it's happening at, at that moment, you know, you're you're you know scared to death, right? But uh, uh, after it's over, everybody's laughing about it. You know, I mean, that uh, holy cow! You didn't believe what just happened? You know, and I mean, 
Uh, that's just the way that uh, that people deal with things like that. And so I tried to to express that in the book to give people a you know a look at at us as we were human beings. You know, I mean, we, we yeah, a lot of us you know we'd come from law enforcement backgrounds, but we were human beings, and we found humor in things that uh, that happened around us. So. I want to ask you uh, one more real quick spy question, two part question. One is, uh, I want your best. No shit, there I was. This happened story. And then, would you rather be working at higher levels, having influence with the commands, and, and working, you know, above battalion level or whatever, and trying to support whether it's State Department or whoever it is, or would you rather be outside the wire in the in the in the thick of it, but exposed to all the danger and everything else? Okay, so. <laughs> I I had no interest uh, in, in 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 being in the higher levels or whatever. I mean, outside the wire is is the only way to go, really. I mean, if you want to, you know, use it that that terminology or whatever. But uh, you know, it's I mean, you're out there, you're getting your hands dirty, you're out there doing the work, you know. And it doesn't matter, you know. There's no medals involved, there's no accolades or anything like that. That's it's the only it's the self fulfillment that you you know you have from being able to, you know, to achieve something that, you know, you know what you did, you know what your colleagues did in that. And I mean, that's, that's all that really matters. And uh, not much different than what soldiers, you know, in, in the, uh, out on the battlefield uh, feel when they've accomplished something, you know, it's, um, you didn't care about medals, you know, you brought your guys back alive. Uh, you didn't lose any colleagues and, uh, you know, and you achieved your mission. And that, that's what mattered more than anything. And what about your no shit there I was story? <laughs> uh, well, I can I can I can mention uh, this now because it was uh, you know a long time ago, and uh, uh, but I was in the uh, the uh, uh, divided city of Berlin, and I was on the wrong side of the wall uh, doing something that uh, would have got us in a lot of trouble if we had gotten caught, and uh, I ended up uh, myself and my colleagues had to dive down an embankment of a little country road when a uh, column of Russian uh, troops uh, were headed our direction. And uh, it was about a 30 or 35 vehicle column, uh, about two o'clock in the morning. And uh, we dove down this embankment off the side of the road, uh, right into the worst damn briar sticker patch you ever saw in your life. And we're down there getting stuck like crazy by stickers and thorns and everything <laughs> yeah, as this column passed us. And it, 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 it got beyond us. And, uh, you know, we were able to extricate ourselves from that, uh, uh, from that, uh, that predicament. But, uh, for the next probably two weeks, all of us were pulling thorns and stickers out of our ass. So, you know, that was one of those no shit. I was there moments. So <laughs> Tim, you got a final question for Dell? I do. I do. Actually, it's kind of for both of you guys. What film or TV series that you guys have seen most accurately depicts the work that you guys have done? After this? You know, for, from a from a police standpoint, uh, I, I loved the old Hill Street Blues series. Uh, it had some it had some defects, but but all in all, it was a pretty good uh, portrayal of of you know life on the streets. Uh, I generally stay away from them. Uh, just because, well, my girlfriend, Julie, she hates watching anything like that with me because I'll sit there and pick it apart, which I know a lot of people in the military do, you know, uh, I can't, I, you know, the, uh, the one movie, uh, that was very, uh, very good. It was a very accurate portrayal of, of what happened was, uh, Argo, uh, the, uh, rescue of the, uh, six, uh, Americans who, uh, were, were hit, you know, hiding out in the, uh, uh, Canadian ambassador's residence and, and how we got them out of the country. It was excellent right up until the end. Then they, you know, they added some, some action into it that never happened uh, just to kind of spice it up a little bit. But, uh, uh, but it was a very accurate portrayal of what, uh, you know, what happened on that operation and just the, uh, the way that uh, uh, they carried themselves. Uh, I think it was Ben Affleck that played the, uh, the lead character in that. And uh, you know, he, um, he walked the walk and, uh, you know, and talked the talk. And, uh, you know, so he actually did a, uh, did a very good job of portraying, um, uh, David Menendez in that, uh, uh, in that, uh, um, uh, operation that occurred. So anyway, uh, uh that's, you know, that's my best, uh, I guess, uh, best ones is uh, Hill Street Blues and, and Argo. 
Those are fantastic. I don't know that anyone's got the uh, field collection intelligence guy thing, right? They often play that person as being like this soft guy who's mostly brainy. The brainy guys stay back in, at the head shed and they do analytical things, and which is great because that's what they're great at. The guys like Dell and myself that go out, you know, my, my KPI is, am I getting shots offered to me during Ramadan from the Iraqi commander? You know I mean? That's, that's what I'm supposed to do is like build friends. And I've not seen that character played very well, but the outpost I think is fantastic for the complexity and the danger of the Afghan fight. And it's just, it's done really, really well. Um, Scott Eastwood was fantastic in it. I really enjoyed him. And then the other movie, I think that, that did a good job. But I think Hurt Locker got how hot it was, right? Like that looked hot. That's exactly what it feels like. The heat is a character in the modern warfare, like in Iraq. Like it is part of your day-to-day grind. You look at your gear and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm about to put this stuff on. And then there's one other movie I was trying to think. Oh, you know what? The uh, the documentary Mosul. And uh, it's fantastic in terms of the modern fight, like what it's like to be shot at in a city. And then the sounds and the and the visions of it, they really do a good job of that. Like you have to bound across this street, this alley, or like I remember, and you lose track of these things. I remember being uh, in a firefight. When I say that, we were being shot at by something, someone, and we were trying to deal with the problem. So mostly I'm just trying to stay out of the way and I'm out of the way, but there are rounds hitting, I don't know, let's say 25 feet from where I'm at, you know, but they're not going to hit me, but I'm in a firefight and it's like no big deal unless you have to go out out that way around that corner we didn't have to in this case but i realized later on as like a, a grown full adult i'm like holy shit i was getting shot at <laughs> you never know what's going to happen you don't know if, if it's covering fire and someone's running towards you or anything anything can happen but mosul does a great job of, of capturing that and then also the 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 lack of humanity in the isis fight and then what the iraqis had to do as they as they try to to deal with that day-to-day fight it's fantastic for that so that's my those are my answers um i I do have to tell this real quick story of playing wiffle ball at the baghdad police academy and uh i had a shutout going into the fifth inning and all of a sudden we came under martyr attack uh after the martyrs were over we resumed our game and i immediately gave up six runs so the damn insurgents threw threw my arm all out of whack you know (laughs) These are real things. These are real things. <laughs> well, listen, I appreciate you coming on. And Tim, I appreciate you hanging out with us. It was it was fun. Everybody should get Dell's book, In the Shadow of the Swords, the Baghdad Police Academy. You. you can get that on Amazon for sure. If you're in the police game or training, you need to get that book. Tim's holding a copy of it up. Dell has been a wonderful guest. Yeah.